You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shravasa Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No simplified funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, we've got Joey Politano, the author of the Apricotaz an econ blog, a blog based on Substack dedicated to economics, monetary policy, talking about stuff like inflation, housing prices, unemployment, very nerdy stuff. And um, and Joey, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You know, it is awesome to have you. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, just before we start, I got to say that everything I say here is just my views, not my employers, not the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the federal government. So if you want to cancel me for something I've said here, uh, my Twitter handle is at Joseph Politano. Go there. Don't attack anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Now, now that we've got that out of the way, uh, you know, for, first off, thank you for being on the podcast. And so, no, I think one thing that the audience would be super interested to know is sort of your background and how, how, how you sort of got into the world of economics. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really interesting as a, um, as a kid, I was into poli sci, and when I went to college, that's what I wanted to do. And mm-hmm. the thing about political science is it's not exactly a lucrative career. Um, so when I was in college, I was like, oh, I should double major in something. I'm going to do something, you know, more uh, higher career prospect. <laughs> so I did <laughs> econ. And by the time I was in about my sophomore year of college, I was like, actually, this poli sci thing, it's not that cool. And this econ thing, it's really cool. Uh, and so I spent the, the bulk of my my college career focused solely on that. Uh, and I wanted to be a Peace Corps volunteer for people who don't know the Peace Corps is like a, a US government volunteer organization. Uh, you're sent to live in a foreign country for a little over two years. You learn a, a language, you work with um, people across the world and it's supposed to be both health, economic development, things like that. Uh, so I was in, I graduated, I was an economic development volunteer in Uganda from about June 2019 until March 2020. Uh, I think you can guess what happened there. (laughs) So I got bounced back to the United States. Uh, And then after a while that I was bounced back, I was like, well, you know, uh, it was hard to feel like I was connected to economics as a discipline. So I started writing a Prikitas, my blog, and being more active online sharing my thoughts, sharing a bunch of data. I think it's been a good learning experience for me. I hope it's been a good learning experience for the people who followed me. It has 100%. You know, it's one of the best econ blogs, like hands down. So fantastic. Um, So I guess to start off, you know, in uh, in terms of the U.S. economy, if most people uh, look at it, what we're seeing is sort of a strong labor market, but at the same time, you're also seeing higher inflation. And so, you know, to get to this point, you know, what, how was what sort of what are the causes and is it sort of caused more by loser monetary policy or more by expansionary fiscal policy yeah um good question i think it's pretty clear to me that the federal reserve once it hits zero percent interest rates in the united states is unwilling to really stimulate that much further uh quantitative easing despite like big headlines showy numbers doesn't do as much as as changes in short-term interest rates uh, functionally, it's just a change in expected future short-term interest rates. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big difference, big X factor between now and 2008 is that in the 2020 recession, the federal government spent a lot more. It's been a lot of uh, deficit-funded spending, particularly the different rounds of stimulus checks and expanded unemployment insurance uh, that kept household incomes afloat. If, if you've been reading my blog, I think I tweet this chart too much sometimes, but like if you look at personal income, uh, nominal personal income in the United States, it's about on trend a little ahead of where it would be if there was no recession 
you know, if COVID had never happened, except that there are all these spikes of saving where people were given money in aggregate and didn't spend all of it again in aggregate. So I think the fiscal impulse has been the bigger deal over the last year. Got it. And, you know, in terms of, so in terms of going forward, uh, so what we saw, you know, what we really saw in 2020, 2021 was sort of a big, you know, big increase in fiscal spending and so you know we so if the if the government sort of maintains fiscal at, at whatever level it is so that that does mean that you know inflation in a way would be transitory right so so what's your view uh what's your take on the whole you know transitory narrative when it comes to inflation i i'm very much on team transitory you can go dig up a blog that i wrote in august that was called yes inflation is transitory which uh, is is hasn't aged the best because I wrote it when inflation was at like 3% annual <laughs> and now it's at, you know, 6 to 7% in the, in the CPI at least. Um, but the, the core theme for me has been you, you can't fundamentally, you can't get extended inflation without accelerating income growth. Not one time shocks in income, but accelerating income growth. Uh, and that's not what we're seeing. And the, the big gap, I think what people have missed so much is that Americans are spending absolutely ridiculous amount of money on goods of all kinds, food, uh, even now takeout restaurants, electronics, um, at-home weights, furniture, any kind of good you can imagine, they're spending somewhere between 30 to 40% more money on aggregate in goods. And there is no way to, <laughs> there's no way to anticipate that. And it takes time for that to work its way through. Um, and I don't think you're going to see, so let's take automobiles as an example. There's about 3.5 million fewer automobiles in the United States than there would be if there was no recession, if production had stayed on track. And prices are up about 50%. But everything you've seen in the last you know, two years tells me that all the automakers are trying their hardest to get cars to market. And the long-term trend in the automobile market has been declining real prices for decades. I don't think you're going to see a situation in which, you know, car prices keep going up unless, like I said before, nominal incomes keep accelerating. Yep. I think this is the thing that most people get wrong, right? So inflation is the rate of change. It's not the absolute level of prices. And so in a way, when you're saying inflation is transitory, all that means is that the rate of change comes down. It's not that the absolute price level comes down, right? Yeah, I mean, I do think there's a lot of uh, a lot of things where the absolute price level is going to go down. Cars being a big one, mm -hmm. not everything. Yep. Um, but right, like <laughs> if gasoline goes up to four dollars a gallon, for it to keep pushing inflation higher, it has to reach really ridiculous levels. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And in fact, you've actually written a post about why the CPI is that, or why or why like the inflation numbers are actually not measured. Um, well enough and sort of the inherent flaws in the way inflation is uh, to measure. So could you talk a little bit about that? You know, why, why, why are inflation measurements flawed? You know, what are, what are the mistakes or, or I guess you couldn't call them mistakes, but what are like the, what are like the, you know, misnomers made when you measure inflation? Right. So the, um, the biggest one, the biggest thing for people to understand is that inflation is a theoretical concept where you say the value of money, how does the value of a dollar change? And the way you measure it is not by actually directly measuring the value of a dollar. It's by taking a bunch of prices and aggregating them and averaging them out and indexing them over yep. time, which is basically just an approximation of the value of a dollar. Uh, so the consumer price index is actually a really good example where CPI biases really high. You know, mm -hmm. it excludes things like healthcare. Healthcare prices have gone up a lot. Yep. But it excludes healthcare and it includes a lot more housing. And if you are an American, you know that housing prices have gone up a lot over the last few decades. Um, and th those costs, you know, are not actually reflective of housing's importance in the U.S. economy. It's reflective of housing's importance in the discretionary section of consumer budgets. And, you know, the other thing, so cars are a great example of this, goods change over time. A 2002... Uh, Honda Accord is very different than a 2020 Honda Accord. Yep. And somehow you have to figure out a way to account for this and all the inflation metrics. So you end up doing a little bit of guesstimates and saying, okay, this car has a little more miles per gallon. It's a little bigger. 
you know, the has more trunk space. Let's try to figure a way that these are congruent, but fundamentally that's a bit of guesswork. And now the, the way that CPI is structured, all of those guesses bias upwards a little bit. So consistently over the last few decades, the consumer price index runs about 0.3% ahead of the Federal Reserve's measure, the personal consumption expenditures price index. Uh, and 0.3% doesn't sound like a lot, but over long periods of time, a lot. it becomes pretty ridiculous. So you'll, you'll see this on Twitter constantly where people will be like, oh, back in 1950, somebody was making you know, $5 an hour, and that translates to $55 today, something like that. <laughs> you know, you, you take these numbers and they're using the consumer price index and they don't know that over like 50 years, CPI is going to bias really heavily upwards. It's going to exaggerate the amount of inflation that's actually taking place. Um, and there's, there's more to it where you're like, most things are measured quite well. Like housing is actually very well measured in inflation. But if you look at like cell phone plans or airline fares or financial products, like the price indexes for financial products, all a mess, yep. Yep. <laughs> all really hard to do, all a bit of a mess. Yep. Yep. And, you know, as you mentioned, housing, you know, something that you recently got a bit of publicity for was you wrote a post about housing. So could you sort of describe, number one, how housing and housing prices are just generally speaking measured in these price indices and also... You know, sort of, um, also sort of, you know, what, what is actually going on when it comes to housing? You know, are, are housing prices actually, you know, going bonkers as everyone is saying, or is there something else going on? Yeah, so it's the hardest part to communicate to people about uh, the consumer price index and about all inflation indexes is that they don't track the price of a house. They don't care at all about the price of the house. They care about rent. And even if you own your house, what the CPI essentially does is say, okay, we have polled, you know, we've, we've interviewed and determined the prices for a bunch of rental units. You own your house, but we're going to pretend as though you were renting it from yourself uh, because we only care about the cost that it would be right this moment, not the cost to buy a house, which is actually, if you think about buying a house, it's basically purchasing rent upfront <laughs> for the next infinite time. Yeah. Um, and BLS doesn't really care about that for an inflation metric. They only care about what prices are today. Uh, so they care about what the rent would be. So they have to do all of these imputations to get, okay, we're taking real rent on a rental unit and we're going to compare it and bring it over to what imputed rent would be on an owner-occupied unit. Yeah. And that trips a lot of people up. So Bill Ackman tweeted something out where he's like, oh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics just asks homeowners, what do you think your house would rent for? Which is not true at all. They ask renters, what does your house rent for? Or they ask landlords what their house rents for. Um, it can be either or. And then they take that rental sample and extrapolate it to owner-occupied housing. So the, the core thing people have missed in that is we have a situation in the United States where rents undeniably are up a little bit from uh, pre-pandemic levels. But this was in the backdrop of a, a time period of rent increasing dramatically over pre-pandemic levels, or dramatically over time. So you're, you're averaging a rent increase of something like three and a half, four percent per year in the United States. And they're up about two to three percent per year since the start of the pandemic. So higher, but at a lower rate. And a lot of the private data, so things like Zillow's indexes or apartment lists, they've gotten... I don't want to say fooled, but they've gotten distorted by the fact that uh, a lot of housing units in very expensive cities have gone on the market. And the housing units that are going on the market are rising in price really fast. The housing units that aren't going on the market aren't really rising in price that much. So these indexes have gotten a little distorted. I still think you're going to see a situation, you know, for 2022, my internal prediction, do not <laughs> do not bet money <laughs> on this. Do not describe this to me. But my internal prediction is something like 4.5 to 5% growth in the housing sections of the consumer price index, meaning rents across the United States are up about 5%, which would be very high by recent standards. But it's not, you know, apartment list says 17% over the last year, which is definitely not true. You know, Zillow says seven, 16 or so percent over the last year. Definitely not true. And so you those indexes, it's not that they're wrong. It's just that they're picking from a non-representative sample 
Yeah, I know it's, I guess uh, that is one of the things that really trips people up. And, you know, moving on, you know, just sticking on the concept of inflation for a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, one concept that's sort of repeatedly come up, but, you know, over the last decade has been claimed to be dead is the Phillips curve. And so, you know, what are your thoughts on the Phillips curve and uh, sort of, you know, Phillips's sort of or original model was, uh, was that, you know, Higher, uh, higher unemployment would mean lesser income, which would lead to lower demand, and you know that would lead to lower price appreciation. And so, you know, so, so it was on the it was sort of on the supply side versus like on the demand side. And so, you know, is the Phillips curve actually dead, or is you know, is the Phillips curve sort of making a comeback? Looking at you know the fact, looking at the fact that you know uh, wages are going up, and so you're, you're also seeing sort of a correlation to um, inflation going up as well. Yeah, there's a really great paper by uh, Nakamura, Steinson, uh, and two other authors that I'm going to kick myself because I've forgotten their name. But looking at the Phillips curve at a state level in the United States, and what they found is not that the Phillips curve died like and came back to life. It's rather that it's always kind of been dead. The relationship uh, between unemployment and inflation is dominated by uh, rapid changes that don't come directly from unemployment. So the variation in unemployment explains very little long run variation in inflation, uh, which is something you should care a lot about if you're trying to prognosticate inflation over the next few years. And I think you've constantly seen this, uh, people attempt to use the natural rate of unemployment and say, okay, you know, back in 2011, people were saying the natural rate of unemployment was five or 6%. The Federal Reserve's official numbers was like five and a half percent. And we are now at a situation today where it's, you know, at four percent. It was almost three percent pre-pandemic. It right. can probably go lower. I think the big mistake people have is they look at unemployment, not employment, and they expect, you know, any long run relationship to hold. Uh, I don't, I don't really think there's any long run relationship between unemployment and inflation to, <laughs> to answer your question really succinctly. And I yep. wouldn't predict anything based on it. Yep. yep. And, you know, speaking on unemployment, you know, uh, the, the labor force has been something that, you know, a lot of people keep stressing about. And one thing that, one thing that the labor force does explain over the long run is the labor force actually explains a significant portion of inflation. So if you sort of took the you know, took the growth rate in the labor force and you sort of regressed that uh, against inflation and you know you sort of and you sort of adjusted for uh, for the lag you know it, it explains a huge part of it and you know, just and so you know well one thing that you've talked about is that you know labor force participation is but well, everyone talks about a structural shift in labor force participation so you know why shouldn't be why shouldn't people actually be worried about that um I like I said before I don't think that there's a very strong empirical relationship between unemployment or for that matter, employment and inflation. Uh, I just want to put that out there. But I think the, the long-term shift you're seeing in the United States is basically twofold. The first is that the, the big one is people are just getting older. Um, there are fewer children, fewer immigrants, and people are living longer and they're living longer in retirement in the United States. Uh, and all of that means is you're going to have a drop in labor force participation. That's not really a crisis. You know, if people are retiring, uh, I personally view that as a good thing. If you've lived a fulfilling life, if you have enough savings, it's fine. You can go retire. The, the real issue in the United States is that since the late 1990s, the percent of prime age workers, meaning people between 25 and 54, people who we expect to be uh, working or most likely to be working, they're not, they haven't saved up for retirement. They might have children of their own. They're... Um, employment rates have been steadily declining. So it peaked in 1998 at around 82%, uh, and they've been declining now, and all, right now are hovering at 78%, and had barely cleared 80 right before the pandemic. Uh, and this is compared to countries like uh, Japan, for example, 85%. Portugal, which, you know, most people don't think of as like labor market success story, 86%. <laughs> Lots of European countries actually yep. do better than the United States. Canada does better than the United States on this. A lot of that is um, aggregate demand failures. Like the 2001 recession was really bad for employment and the 2008 recession was really, really bad for employment. Right. And a lot of that is um, structural issues in the United States, particularly around women's employment. Much more difficult for women to get jobs 
much more difficult to support a family in the United States uh -huh. while working. And so often the childcare burdens fall disproportionately on women. Uh, that's what I worry about in the, in the labor market. I worry that you're not actually going to have a U.S. labor market that's as strong as even places like Japan or Portugal. Got it, got it. And uh, yeah, moving on, you know, the Fed sort of in its, mo or Powell in, uh, in his most recent press conference sort of talked about how he was going to drop the use of the word transitory. And uh, you know, everyone's been on, uh, uh, everyone's been off about, you know, Fed hikes and Fed tapering. And, uh, you know, one, one line of explanation goes that, you know, in order for inflation to be transitory, sort of the right policy at the moment is to keep rates low simply because um, uh, mo most of the issues right now are caused by supply chains. And so if you allow, if you keep rates low, that would actually allow supply chains to expand, you know, which would clear those blockages. And, you know, we would see uh, inflation become transitory. Um, would, would, do you sort of buy into that? Or do you, so what was your uh, reaction when you saw the Fed decision? And, uh, and you, know, are they, you know, are they actually getting it right? Right. Um, this is a pretty tough question. I lean fairly dovish. I'm sure it's not a surprise to people who've been yeah. listening so far. <laughs> um, but I, I think it was marginally a mistake to raise rates, but it was not a crisis level mistake. You know, the, the goal for the Federal Reserve, in my mind, is to keep um, wage income growing at a stable rate. And so if you think about like 4% growth in aggregate wages, that's about... Um, two percent productivity and you don't have to worry about lots of transitory shifts in inflation you know this was a big right. upward shift but to take 2014 2015 you know the drop in oil prices basically pulled inflation down to one percent and nobody at the federal reserve panicked and thought like oh the economy's collapsing <laughs> demand's falling apart so we all knew that wages were going up at a normal rate it was yeah. just that you know oil prices happened to tank um i think the the marginal risk, if you're Jerome Powell, is that like gross labor income, by which I mean the total amount of wages and salaries received by workers in the economy, uh, is actually about to overshoot the pre-pandemic trend, uh -huh. meaning pe people are making more than in, in nominal terms than they would be expected to make had there been no pandemic. It's a basically on trend. But if you're the Federal Reserve, that, that number going above trend is very worrisome because it, it functionally means that uh, you know, nominal wages are increasing really rapidly. Nominal incomes are really increasing really rapidly. If nominal spending increases really rapidly, that's how you get broad-based inflation. And, you know, I don't think it's going to overshoot dramatically. Um, <laughs> my point is that that would be the concern from the Federal Reserve's point of view. And I think that the tapering is part of the reason why it's not going to overshoot dramatically. Other reasons why is you're going to have a, a contractionary fiscal impulse in yep. 2022 the you know, all of the all of the stimulus measures have expired and like we've said before the long-run trend in most economies uh, over the last excuse me most high-income economies over the last 20 years has been lower interest rates lower inflation rates lower nominal income growth rates and sadly lower real income growth rates and so i still think the the long-term risk is to the downside long-term risk is that you have very low inflation uh, and a weak economy, not that you have, you know, high inflation and a somewhat stronger economy. Yep. Um, and do you think that the, uh, so just generally speaking, you know, uh, normal people are like, you know, just ordinary people, they, they sort of have faith in policymakers to take care of, uh, uh, of inflation, of, you know, prices going up. And do you think that, you know, if the Fed actually didn't act and say, you know, the Fed, uh, you know, bought into sort of the dovish, uh, the dovish side, and let's say the dovish side, you know, ended up taking longer to play out than was initially expected. Do you think there's sort of a risk to Fed credibility in that sort of situation? I know, like you know, most people on Fed Twitter would be, it would be, you know, jumping with joy and you know, and cynicism <laughs> and go, you know, who believes in the Fed at all anyway, right? So it's 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 uh, and so do you think that you know there's actually a risk to Fed, Fed credibility considering that you know, most ordinary families, um believe that, you know, the Fed and the and policymakers in general, you know, have the power to, one, control inflation, and two, also, you know, the, also they believe that they will control inflation, you know, as and when required. Well, the first thing I'll say is that it's always important to remember that normal people don't care about the Fed. 
Um, not this is not trying to be mean, but like if you're not a, a finance professional, the Federal Reserve's decision making is important to your life, but it's not something you're hyper focused on. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't think that there's people out there who are thinking like they're watching Jerome Powell's pressers and they're thinking, oh, I'm I'm reassured now that prices won't go up. Um, if if you look at consumer expectations formation is is really uh, what's what's the best way to say it is like it has a lot of inertia, meaning you know people see price increases and they expect more price increases, which you know historical record that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, if you look at one year forward inflation expectations, so like the University of Michigan uh, survey of consumers, it basically tracks gas prices. <laughs> gas prices go up, people think inflation's coming, and yeah, you know, it's funny because when gas prices go up, normally what happens is actually the prices come back down <laughs> yeah. a little bit later. The opposite happens. Um, but that should, you know, p- normal people aren't tracking the Federal Reserve's every move. Uh, I think the, the bigger credibility issue is with uh, is with firms and with decision-making at a uh, corporate level. So here's actually a great example of the inverse. So like car companies, when when the pandemic hit, Lots of car companies believe that this was like a repeat of the 2008 recession. It's going to be a disaster. Like, you know, only companies that cut back dramatically are going to survive. And they were caught off guard by a situation in which the Federal Reserve and uh, the federal government came in and supported households in a way they didn't in 2008. The, The expectations of people at GM and Ford were really important. And they're part of the reason that we're in this situation now where uh, there aren't enough cars, period. The yeah. production was cut back. Uh, and, you know, the inverse of that is true, where the, if people at Ford or General Motors or at grocery stores or whatever think, hey, the Federal Reserve isn't really going to restrain income growth, they're not really going to restrain spending, you know, this right remain, this might even accelerate, then they're going to raise prices and um, you might end up with a problem. So that I, I this is say Fed credibility is important, but sometimes it's important in different ways than people think, and it's important holistically. Right. And uh, you know, you, you you talked a little bit about cars, and you know, you've written about you know a crisis in uh, in vehicle manufacturing, and you know how that's affecting the economy and everyday life. So could you talk a bit about the car crisis? What what is actually going on? You know how it sort of started. You know what was like the catalyst for it to start, and you know how you see it playing out. Sure. And so um, over the last year, you've seen about a 50% increase in used vehicle prices right. and about a 25% increase in new vehicle prices, which mm-hmm. is by and large unprecedented in U.S. history. Um, and the catalyst for this has been the pandemic being a situation in which, um, you know, the, the first part is car makers were caught off guard in, in the wake of the 2008 recession. They actually had the opposite problem. If you listen to like anything that uh, a automaker executive said in like 2008, 2014, they were really rosy. They were like, oh, this will be over and <laughs> this will be over in two years. It'll blow by. We'll be okay. Yeah. Everything will be fine. And that proved to be completely false. And it, it sort of institutionally and uh, individually, like on a personal level, got embedded in a lot of car companies that like, if there's a recession, we are going to get hit real hard. And they saw the mother of all recessions coming uh, and said, we're going to get absolutely smashed. And so they cut back production dramatically. Um, if you look in, in March of 2020 and in April of 2020, capacity utilization, meaning the total amount of capacity production used by American automakers, it was 7%, not 17, not 77. <laughs> Basically, nothing was being assembled in North America because everyone wow. expected that you know there'd be a surplus of cars. You saw places like Hertz, or enterprise like liquidating large chunks of their rental fleet because they saw the same thing in 2008. They were scared that uh, rental prices are going to go down and they wanted to protect their balance sheets. So they liquidated a bunch of assets. Uh, and then you had this fiscal support come in and you had a situation in which Americans can't go on planes. They don't want to go on public transport. Yeah. So what else are they going to do? They're all going to drive. And even uh, people haven't realized this, but like work from home, increases driving. People take a lot more short trips when they're working from home, even though they're not commuting, you know, 30 miles a day, they're driving 45 miles in two mile bursts. Uh, 
And so you, you've ended up with this situation where demand for automobiles is way up and production is way down. And it's the automakers realize this a couple months in, like oh, people are buying these things like hotcakes. We got to do something here. <laughs> uh, and by this point, they had messed up their entire supply chain by canceling all these orders. Now they're at the back of the line for everything from lights, electronic parts, you know, semiconductors are really important. Yeah. And vehicle manufacturing is a fairly COVID dangerous activity. Uh, in the in the grand scheme of you know manufacturing assembly it, it requires a lot of workers to be in fairly close proximity to each other uh, and so there were lots of situations you know tesla had its plants in california shut down uh, toyota had its japanese plants shut down for c- pure covid reasons um it made it very difficult and so yeah we have this situation in which there are fewer cars than there should be and there's much more demand for cars than there otherwise would be and so unsurprisingly, you've seen the, the prices rise dramatically. Uh, and in, in my view, I think it's going to take probably two years to fix. Um, just because peop- the, the car makers are that far behind. So I mentioned that they're 3.5 million vehicles behind. It's important to realize that they've been falling farther behind. <laughs> they've yep. not been catching up. About in, in the summer, it was closer to 2 million vehicles. So they're another one and a half million vehicles behind just in the last uh, six months or so. Got it, got it. And and you've uh, and you've also sort of talked about you know how American manufacturing is sort of coming back and uh, and sort of the changes that are taking place within the manufacturing sector. So number one is that so number one in the uh, you've talked about uh, so uh, sort of in that point you sort of talked about. Uh, capacity and how you know capacities sort of fail but at the same time you're seeing companies invest in machinery you know semiconductors are growing you know machinery production is increasing etc so do you think in the long run number one this is a good thing and number two you know uh, and number two um what exactly is going on here you know is the is this sort of like a long-term shift is this sort of a you know uh sort of a shift short term just to fix these supply chain issues you know what's what is going on Sure. So um, obviously the last two decades or so have been dominated by uh, decreasing proportion of domestic goods manufactured in America and a lot of imports. Yep. Uh, and, you know, uh, some of that, a, a critical chunk of that is a free trade story where goods are, are manufactured for a lower price abroad uh, and Americans are transitioning into higher paying jobs that tend to be in the service sector. Um, but Another big chunk of that is just that, you know, post the 2008 recession, especially demand was so weak in the United States economy that a lot of um, manufacturing jobs were lost unnecessarily. Uh, the, the automakers, like I mentioned, are a good example of this, where uh, if the 2008 recession never happened or if their response was as strong as it was during COVID, uh, I don't think you would have seen the pre serious reductions in automaking capacity within the United States that you did see post 2008. Um, and so in, in the last year, everybody's been stuck at home. Like I said before, when you're stuck at home and you can't buy services, you just buy a lot of goods <laughs> and Americans have been buying a lot, a lot of goods. Yep. Um, and the result has been a lot of American manufacturers and, and you know, related companies like transportation, warehousing, um, producing a lot and critically investing a lot. Um, And so if you look at like sales of capital goods or purchases of capital goods or fixed investment by manufacturers, they're all up fairly significantly and they're doing much better than you would expect given the severity of the recession. Uh, And to me, that's a signal that, you know, this is a temporary boost, you know, to good spending. But I think it's a signal that people expect demand to be strong long-term and they expect a little bit of that boost in good spending to be permanent. So I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, people are going to go back to their lives, uh, consuming services, going to concerts, getting haircuts, watching movies or whatever. But I think people will be spending more time at home. You know, like we talked about the work from home revolution, that's more time spent at home. Uh, And they'll be demanding more goods just because the economy is stronger. So I see that as a as, as a serious positive. Got it, got it. Moving on, um, I'm talking a bit about 
uh, monetary policy. So, you know, you've talked about the yield curve being a policy choice. So, you know, at the moment, you know, what would be the right way to sort of structure the yield curve? You know, would you want it to be flatter? Would you want it to be, um, would you want it to be steeper? And sort of the issue over the last eight, 10 years is, uh, uh, since the great financial crisis has been um, uh, that banks aren't lending enough. And now that's, that's sort of what uh, lending growth has been low, uh, which, which is supposedly, which is sort of what's caused um, inflation to not be, uh, to not be as high as you know people thought it would be. So you know, uh, so uh, so you know, number one, why why what makes yield curve as a policy choice? And number two, you know, what what is the right policy choice at the moment? Right. So the the understanding that yield curves are a policy choice is is twofold. The first is that you always have to keep in mind that money is nominal, meaning you know it's it's just money. It's something we made up, <laughs> even though it's a big institution in our lives. You can change the quantity of it. Um, and the Federal Reserve controls that primarily through interest rates. Uh, you know, everyone agrees at a societal level that the Federal Reserve controls a short-term interest rate. They explicitly set it. But it's important to keep in mind that they set expectations for future short-term interest rates. Uh, and the reason that the yield curve is a policy choice is because through their setting of um, expected short-term rates, they can functionally pin the yield curve wherever they want. Now, that doesn't mean pinning the yield curve is a really good idea. So I don't advocate for yield curve control like what's done in Japan. Um, I think that's an extreme choice that's brought upon by previous monetary policy failures. So Japan has had three decades where they've had zero inflation and no nominal income growth and no nominal wage growth. And the result of that is that the economy is so weak that you have to pin a uh, long-term interest rate at 0% or you're going to have a massive problem. You don't quite have the same issue in the United States, where the economy is uh, strong enough that long, you know, I don't expect that short term rates will be pinned at zero forever, the way that they kind of are in Japan. Um, or even like there is an Austrian 100 year bond, uh, and that bond I think trades below 1%. I, I would have to look it up. Obviously, I don't think I <laughs> have it memorized, but I know it trades really low. And what that's telling you is that people expect inflation and real interest rates in the euro area to be really low. Um, and, and the important thing, you know, to understand, like I said, money is a nominal variable, but it has real effects. Yep. So um, when Federal Reserve raises interest rates, uh, you see a flattening a lot of the time because people expect future growth to be lower. And that's really not an optimal outcome. Uh, it's not necessarily that flattening itself is bad. It's that flattening is usually caused because people expect constant inflation and if the yield curve is flat it means they expect constant inflation and very little growth so you're having a bit of that situation right now in the united states where the yield curve is getting flatter like short-term rates are going up and long-term rates aren't rising by as much um and i think that's it's mostly fine like i said i don't think you should be targeting like the 30-year rate in the united states uh, but it's something to be concerned about and always keep your mind on. You know, the 2018 yield curve inversion was basically a signal to the Fed that they were way too aggressive in raising rates. Right. Um, and they responded very well to that signal. They, you know, brought short-term rates back down, averted the crisis. Uh, but it's something that you always have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. And uh, one thing that a lot of just you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the consensus on FinTwit shares is that you know since two thousand and eight you know when uh, when rates have been roughly zero percent you know people have argued that you know these lower rates have led to higher stock prices and you know uh, the higher asset uh, and you know higher asset prices in general and all that's meant is that you know the top one percent keep getting richer at the expense of uh, at the expense of the bottom you know fifty percent or whatever and therefore you know it's uh, it's this loose monetary policy that's ac that's actually exacerbating uh, wealth inequality. However, you know you've argued that uh, the issue is not loose monetary policy; it's actually tight monetary policy. Uh, that that's the problem, and that has been the problem. So, could you sort of expand on that? You know, uh, number one, how's the policy that we've had since two thousand eight? How's that not loose? And uh, you know, uh, and you know, what are the mistakes that have been made that have caused inequality to be exacerbated? Yeah, these are two, two great questions. So let's talk about um, loose versus tight monetary policy. Uh, there's a great Friedman quote that I'm going to butcher, 
but it's something like I, I thought the fallacy of conflating low interest rates with loose monetary policy was dead, but yeah. apparently old fallacies never die. Um, by which he meant that like if you're in a situation where rates are really low and inflation and or you know I like to talk about nominal income growth, inflation and nominal income growth are really low, that means monetary policy is too tight. That was a situation in uh, 2008 onward. I would argue it was a situation from about 2006 onward, um, but just that wage, wage growth sort of kept a bit of inertia up to 2008. Um, and in such a situation, it's important to acknowledge like that, that raw number, that 0% interest rate or whatever, it's not actually telling you how well the economy is doing, what inflation is at or, or whatnot. And people get a little bit tricked by that. So obviously, if you look at Japan, I, I hate always bringing up Japan, but they're <laughs> a good example. Japan has 0%. They have negative interest rates, but they have no inflation. The real interest rate in Japan is a little bit higher than it is in the United States. Right. Um, and real growth in Japan is much, much lower. And nominal growth is much, much lower. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's you know pretty obvious that the monetary policy is too tight in Japan. Um, a lot of my econ friend group is advocates of nominal gross domestic product targeting or nominal gross labor income or just nominal income in general. Yep. Right, which I mean, whatever interest rate you select that keeps wages and spending growing at a constant rate um, is the right quote unquote interest rate. Um, and if you have a situation like post 2008 where nominal incomes and nominal spending are growing at really low rates, it means the interest rate is, um, is too high. Monetary policy is too tight. Uh, I know people are going <laughs> to, my friend group's going to get upset at me for conflating interest rates with monetary policy. That's a whole separate discussion. Uh, and now on, on the inequality thing, the critical thing to realize is that the most valuable asset 90% of Americans own is their job. And if you have a situation in which, you know, uh, monetary policy is too tight, people are going to lose their jobs. And the people most likely to lose their jobs almost all the time are lower income people. Um, and so the last 10 years have seen a situation in which job prospects for people at the bottom were very poor, income growth was extremely low. Um, and it was you know, hard to get a job, hard to keep a job, hard to save from a job, hard to get a leg up on opportunities because the economy in general was so weak. Uh, and that damages low-income people much, much more than it helps, quote unquote, high-income people by literally lowering the interest rate, lowering the discount rate on their assets. Um, and you have a situation in which, like, if monetary policy was better through 2008, um, more people would have had jobs, incomes would have been higher, and wealth as a total would have been higher. But more critically, you would have had a situation where wages at the lower end of the income scale were growing faster than at the higher end. So right today, wages for the lowest 25% of income earners are growing faster than wages for the highest 25%. And that was true also in the late 1990s when the labor market was really tight, the economy was doing really well, and monetary policy was doing a good job. It was not true for basically the bulk of the last decade and a half. Uh, and so that's, you know, you're exacerbating inequality by taking away low-income people's jobs and reducing their wage growth. Got it, got it. And, um, you know, and uh, well, w w another thing that you sort of argued is that you know, when it comes to national debt, number one, there are actually mistakes that are made when measuring national debt. And a view that is shared by a large amount of the consensus is that, you know, national debt is sort of going through the roof and, you know, this is sort of becoming a big issue. Um, do you think that national debt is actually an issue? I'm guessing you don't. <laughs> and what are, what are the mistakes made uh, or what are, that caused the measures of national debt to be incomplete? Right. So, so the, um, the critical thing to realize about the, the national debt is its primary problem, quote unquote, is that it will crowd out private investment. So, you know, if the federal government is deficit spending a lot and they have a lot of debt already on the books, the interest rates are gonna to have to be higher to um, keep the economy balanced. And as a result, private investment is going to be lower. That's the, the essence of crowding out there. Um, yep. But it's not, that, that crowding out essence is not one-to-one -one analogous with like the debt to GDP ratio. 
uh, in particular because the spending that the federal government does you know, can go directly into people's hands like we saw during the pandemic uh, and can stimulate additional economic growth. And it literally is just, you know, if the federal government owes money, it means people in the private sector have a surplus of money or that, you know, their net balance sheets are positive. Uh, the, a lot of it also comes from, how should I put this? A little bit of confusion around the, the construction of federal liabilities. You know, in, in the United States, a large chunk of money from the federal government is owed to other parts of the federal government. So the Social Security Trust Fund is owed from the U.S. Treasury to the Social Security Administration, which is like you say that your, your checking account owns your, owes your savings account money. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> and, you know, the Federal Reserve has a lot of assets. So functionally, the Federal Reserve has to, to remit assets back to the Treasury. So if the federal government owes the Federal Reserve money, it's the same thing. Checking account can't owe the savings account money. The flip side of that, though, is that the reserve balances um, that the Federal Reserve owes to, to banks, those are also national debt. So it cancels out a little bit. I, the Federal Reserve turns a profit. It's, it's pretty significant, but nothing crazy. Um, the bigger issue is like, if you look at interest that the federal government pays as a share of GDP, so right now it's extremely low by historical standards. In 2017, total interest paid hit the lowest ever, even though debt was really high. In the late 1990s, interest paid was really high despite the debt being relatively low. That situation in the late 1990s is actually when national debt is a much bigger issue than today when uh, interest paid is so low basically because in the late 1990s, it was crowding out more investment than today. You know, that's the important thing for people to realize. So Japan uh, pays like zero interest on its debt. <laughs> it's not, not crowding out any public investment. Yep. I would, I think they should spend more money. <laughs> yep. Quite frankly, I think they have a problem in spending too little money. A lot mm -hmm. of European countries have the same issue. Um, but you can't just look at the debt to GDP number and, and sort of... Um, work backwards from there yeah and you know that you know, that analogy of sort of the savings account owing the checking account is sort of super useful simple and you know people sort of extrapolate that and say that what's going on right now is sort of reminiscent or sort of resembles um uh, uh, sorry not reminiscent resembling of uh, mmt and uh would you would you say that that's uh, would you say that it's true or that's mostly true they would argue that you know the federal reserve yeah, while, while it cannot directly buy at auction, you know, the, this, uh, the pace at which they're buying national debt is, to, is pretty high and they own uh, a reasonable portion of the total amount of uh, treasuries outstanding. And so they would argue that what's, what we're seeing right now is sort of uh, some version of modern monetary theory. So would you, would you argue that that is sort of a, a good explanation of what's going on? Or would you say, you know, that, that explanation is faulty? Um, man, you really are trying to get me canceled on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the MMT explanation of a lot of financial activities is helpful, sometimes not fully accurate. You know, the, the yield curve being a policy choice, something I believe, something MMT also believes, and uh, the, the national debt not literally mattering in a numerical sense, but mattering in a sense of crowding out investment is also something um, that the two of us believe, although I think I worry much more about crowding out investment than most MMTers. Um, I, I think the one thing to, that people should realize is it's not like a new idea that the Federal Reserve is backing national debt. So I think you hear this sometimes where you're like, oh, no one would buy US national debt if the Federal Reserve wasn't there. Or, to purchase it on, on the other end. Um, but obviously every dollar bill has the full faith and credit of the US government backing it, has it printed on the, on the back if you actually wanna go look <laughs> and confirm it for yourself. Um, the, the federal government has always done this. The only difference now is how the accounting works um, in an abundant reserve system that we've had since 2008. So like I said, the, the critical thing to remember is that when the federal government, or when the Federal Reserve, excuse me, when the Federal Reserve buys debt from the federal government, they have to do it with reserves, reserves bear interest. Uh, 
Um, we have interest on reserves and interest on excess reserves. It's very small, but it's there. And so the distinction between reserves, which bear interest, and like T-bills or very short-term government debt also bears interest at really similar rates, um, is really not that big in the grand scheme of things. It matters a lot to people who run money market funds. It doesn't matter a lot to the average person. <laughs> yeah. um, and it doesn't matter a lot on, on the aggregate system level. So it's not that you know the federal government or the Federal Reserve rather is like funding the US government with all these infusions of cash. It's that they're swapping around the kinds of financial assets that are in the banking system. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, so for the question, that's hundred percent going to get you canceled on Twitter. So, you know, what are your <laughs> what are your thoughts on MMT? And you know, if we actually follow like a full version of MMT since say the Great Financial Crisis, you know, do you think the U.S. would have actually been better off? Uh, considering the statements that you've made uh, around the dynamics of tight monetary policy versus loose monetary policy and the exacerbation of wealth inequality, or would you say that you know, pursuing a full-on MMT policy since 2008 would actually make the U.S. worse off today? Um, I, I think a full employment policy would have been uh, extremely important in the post-2008 environment. Um, I think that a... Uh, Emphasis on increasing nominal incomes or, or willingness to use fiscal policy would have been very important, especially in the context where, you know, monetary policy refuses to stimulate further. So I do believe monetary policy can stimulate more at 0% interest rates. The problem is that all the things that it could do, like intervening in foreign exchange markets or guaranteeing low interest rates, like for the infinite future, are really difficult from a political economy perspective. And fiscal policy, it's a lot easier from, <laughs> from a political economy perspective. Um, I am not an mmt -er. I don't like ascribing to, to any ideology, especially in economics, because I think- um, <laughs> Unless I, you're I think an Austrian. It, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, you know what? There's actually a good, I think it's George Selgin quote. Someone's gonna hit, kick me if I, I got this wrong. But he said like, okay, if you're gonna publish something, and say, this is Austrian economics, this is MMT. Um, you're trying to lend it a credibility by putting it in part of a larger theory when the idea should be able to stand on its own. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so I'm very big believer in uh, full employment. I think that's an in incredibly important policy goal, but I do not believe in a jobs guarantee. Um, I think that having the federal government directly employ large numbers of people is inferior in a lot of ways to universal basic income or uh, like stimulus checks or any of the other mechanisms that they have that are less, you know, command and control, less hands-on. And that, that's, I think it's important to make that argument, but I think it's also important to say, okay, this is how my policy preferences differ from all these different ideologies. I can do, I like this policy, not this set of ideological packages, um, especially when it comes to economics that can throw you for a loop. There are, there are people who are, um, <laughs> you know, conventional orthodox economists who are very brilliant and have good ideas. There are people who are conventional orthodox economists who I think have very bad ideas. And I think if you just say, okay, I'm going to keep the orthodoxy you're going to miss, miss a lot. And I think in the same respect, if you say, I'm just going to take whichever heterodox theory I like, uh -huh. you're going to miss a lot. Yep. Yep. Economics is really complicated, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've noticed. Yep. A hundred percent. And so, you know, with the, uh, and so, you no, know, is there anything that we haven't covered in the podcast that, you know, you wanted to talk about or that, you know, you wanted to mention? I mean, of course, everyone wanna... go to uh, go subscribe to a prick task. That's A P R I C I T A S. You know, it's one thing that, you won't regret for sure. <laughs> Did you? I, I know. I know you'd ask for the um, like viewer submitted or listener submitted questions. Did you want to ask any of those? So I did. So uh, uh, so that's what. So uh, so I guess one one thing that I would have asked, and I guess uh, that I think I missed on asking was, you know, would you, what do you think that you know economists would actually make good investors, or do you think you know that's so that that is something that's not really. Um, uh, that, uh, that, that doesn't really matter for, for um, lack of a better word. It would be interesting to hear your thoughts because you know, you're is, sort of an economist. So. This is a good one. I, 
think that the only good macro trade is long spy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a, you know, all, all of the empirical finance literature is that if you are a normal person, quote unquote, um, the far and away best thing you can do is just invest in an index fund that covers a broad section of the market. Or if you want to get really fancy, you can go for like some of the risk factors like profitability or yeah. um, value or small cap or whatever. Um, but I, I think the track record for economists as investors is pretty bad. Um, <laughs> I write my newsletter very conscious of the fact that I don't want people to directly make investment decisions based on what I say. Um, by which I mean, yeah, don't come to me if SPY goes down 20% and said, you, you told me to go on SPY. <laughs> don't come to me for that one. <laughs> but um, what, what I mean is that, like, I think the evidence is that all but a select few extremely intelligent, highly dedicated people have a negative um, expected value when they trade. And if you are not one of those, like, top 0.1% people, you're much better off just buying an index fund. Um, the value add for economics, in my opinion, is not at the investment level, it's at the corporate level. You know, getting companies to make better decisions in the face of uncertainty right. is really hard. And that's where economists come in. And, and part of the problem is if you're an investor, you have an additional level of uncertainty where you're not really sure. <laughs> You know, if you're investing in a company, you're not 100% sure how every right. level of that company operates, how they think, how they're going to react to every situation. And you can't be. Um, and so if you're within a company, you can at least make some better choices, improve their decision making. Uh -huh. I think that's yep. a much bigger value add than trying to you know, pick stocks or make investment decisions based on you know, macro theories. Well, it also helps out newsletter subscription, so... <laughs> <laughs> it helps sell newsletter subscriptions. Listen, right. if you if you're recommending stocks, you can you can charge a lot more. That's true. Right. This is exactly. why I, I couldn't be a Substack professional. <laughs> I'm not gonna shill stocks to people. Yep. Well, Joey, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was awesome. You know, I had a great time. Learned a lot. I think the audience is gonna learn a lot as well. Uh, you know, shared some awesome information. And of course, you know, once again, you know, if you're listening to it and you know you've gotten this far, you know, make sure that you subscribe to Joey's uh substack uh a p r i c i t a s dot substack dot com and thank you so much for being hey, on the podcast yeah i'm on i'm on twitter it's just at joseph politano i'm also on linkedin you can add me there if you're one of those people that uses linkedin as a social network <laughs> <laughs> with that thank you so much for being on the show so. thank you for having me